This is Knessa Eo, and I will be bringing you Lecture 13 on the Capitalist Firm. Contextualizing the Capitalist Firm, we can use Apple as an example. Apple outsources the assembly of these firms to lower wage countries. However, the assembly only accounts for about 4% of the cost. Apple is also purchasing the rights to utilize high-tech components from higher wage countries like Germany and Japan, and this will account for the majority of the cost of production. We can think about uh, a previous model of an iPhone 7. It was about $225 to produce each model and sold for $650. And so you can think about the cost of production rising now, and now we can see different iPhones selling anywhere from $1,000 to $1,500. Thinking about the role of firms in general, they do a couple things. First is hiring labor. Think about that as the assembly process. They purchase the inputs, so this could be purchasing raw materials or purchasing rights to utilize certain materials. And then they sell the output for a profit. Um, so the selling for $650 relative to the $225 cost. Um, once the product finally goes to market, the, the goal will be to generate profit there and they're the major actors in a capitalist economy. So now firms are recognized as individual entities and legal parties and so forth, and firms interact with buyers um, in the marketplace. Now we can ask the question, is the capitalist firm a good institution? And so there's a couple things to reflect on when answering this question. First, have you ever worked for a firm? Think about uh, that example. Was the firm efficient? Um, and then think about, did the firm produce a lot of surplus? So obviously working for Apple, we can see that they're gener generating a lot of surplus. Um, and so this is something to think about. And then finally thinking about, was it fair in this process? So if you're, or if you're generating a surplus, how is that surplus split? What type of institutions are in place um, to sort of answer the question of fairness? And so this is something that we wanna reflect on when thinking about um, the quality or whether we want to say that a capitalist firm is a good or bad institution. Now we'll use a little bit of foreshadowing to cover um, sort of what type of assumptions we're making in the model next week. So the model will use, uh, or it'll be a model of bargaining with firms built on a couple of assumptions uh, and we'll draw on past knowledge here. So the first being that there are gains from trade. So anytime to uh, individuals, firms, any of those examples come together, there are potential uh, gains for both parties. We know that firms will adopt technologies with the lowest costs. Uh, from unit two, we covered the ISO costs uh, with the coal um, technology example. Collective projects can result in social dilemmas. So in unit four, we covered the process of uh, tragedy of the commons, different types of games, prisoners dilemmas, and so forth, where individuals uh, best or their pursuit of their self-interest has a less than optimal outcome. And then voluntary contracts determine the size of the surplus and how it's shared. So in the Angela and Bruno model example, uh, different types of contracts were assessed throughout the model and those determined the surplus and how it was allocated. Next week, we'll, you'll cover the labor discipline model, which will be presented in unit six, and it'll explain a couple things um, or it'll attempt to explain how wages are determined and how the surplus is shared between the owners and the workers of a firm. Now let's think about firms a little more generally. In the capitalist economy, the division of labor is coordinated by a couple of things. So the first is the firms. Firms decide what type of product uh, they're going to produce and then they'll hire accordingly. So in the case of Apple, they're hiring programmers, engineers, and so forth. And it's also coordinated by markets. And so markets respond to price signals and so forth. And so in this case, uh, firms will utilize their comparative advantage to decide what type of things they will produce and what type of things they'll utilize from other producers uh, in, the, in, the pro in the production process. Think about firms as just sort of a representation uh, of this concentration of economic power in which owners and managers direct work. So owners and managers, they send signals down, owners send signals to the managers, and man managers send signal uh, to the workers. And so we can think about these sort of processes as different commands that, down, uh, that pass down the chain. 
and markets are characterized by the opposite. They're sort of this decentralization of economic power in which individuals engage in voluntary transactions and an order in this case is sort of signaled as a purchase. Thinking about the coordination process, uh, Herbert Simon helped to shed light on this issue. He was a political scientist, but we celebrate him today as an economist. And his work was asking or answering the question as to why firms hire workers. And so there's a couple different reasons. When tasks are easily specified in a contract, firms contract workers to individuals or other firms. However, when tasks are uncertain and difficult to write into a contract, firms hire workers to follow the boss's orders. And so this seems intuitive, but think about different processes in which you've worked for firms and sort of your job description was laid out. However, on a daily basis, you're running into different tasks that are not uh, explicitly described in the job description. And so this is something in which uh, we would think about that contract is incomplete. And so in this case, generally, you'll just pass questions up the chain. You'll ask managers and so forth, and they'll help you address these tasks. And he won the Nobel Prize um, for his pioneer research in the decision-making process within economic organizations. We'll highlight that with his analogy here or his example with the Martian's telescope. And so in this case, um, he describes the firms reveal themselves, say, as solid green areas with faint interior contours, marking out divisions and departments. And so in this case, he's just describing sort of a visualization of different processes and how these chains are sort of laid out. Uh, market tra transactions show as red lines connecting firms, forming a network in the spaces between them. Within firms, and uh, within firms, the approaching visitor also sees pale blue lines, the lines of authority connecting bosses with various levels of, wor levels of workers. So in this case, we can see that different relationships are sort of mapped out in different colors, uh, sort of mapping out a couple different things, whether individuals are engaging in transactions or whether individuals are sort of responding to a chain of command. Earlier, we described these firms as concentrations of economic power. And so we can utilize this example of capitalist firms as planned economies. And so let's think about this. In markets, people respond to prices. Uh, for example, if you're purchasing gas and you have two gas stations just across the street from each other, you'll respond uh, to the price mechanism on their billboard or whatever. Uh, whichever one is lower, you'll tend to purchase your gas from that, um, from that particular gas station. However, in firms, people do not respond to these prices, they follow orders. Uh, this is illustrated by Ronald Coase, um, another Nobel Prize winner in this example. If a workman moves from department Y to X, he does not go because of a change in prices, but because he's ordered to do so. And so in this case, the distinguishing mark is the suppression of the price mechanism within a firm. So individuals aren't responding to anything uh, within a firm, but rather they're simply following orders in the chain of command. And so a capitalist firm in this case is a miniature privately owned, centrally planned economy. Um, the Chicago School of Economics referred to these things as like mini capital markets and so forth, uh, but this has been a long tradition um, in economics to utilize this example. Here we have a nice little visual illustration of the coordination of work. So the board of directors, these owners are passing down information and tasks to the manager, and then the manager is doing the same down to the workers. So in this case, uh, we can see that different people are tasked with different responsibilities. Then we can add this element of sort of information transfer. So these solid lines are indicating uh, more accurate transfer of information. And so think about your experience within a firm where there are a lot, there's a lot of information that you as workers pass on to each other that aren't passed up. Um, and the same goes uh, for vice versa. So in terms of owners not passing an information down to managers and so forth. And so that is the dashed or uh, the dashed green lines in this case that sort of represents this asymmetric information that's being passed back up the chain. Now let's think about this coordination a little more. The owners of, the, of a firm are its residual claimants. So the revenues that a firm receives will be used to pay uh, workers, managers, and creditors, and so forth. However, uh, whatever is left over is what we refer to as the residual or profit, and the owners will claim this. So we can think about the different incentives here. 
um, if workers and managers all do their job well, these firms will or the owners will definitely benefit. However, the workers and managers will not necessarily benefit. They only benefit in this case if they receive a promotion, bonus, or salary. Uh, so in this case, we can see that different parties have different interests um, when engaging in this interaction. Uh, we know that large corporations separate ownership from control. So we have the famous uh, Adam Smith quote here who's sort of illustrating a fundamental problem is that whenever you're dealing with other people's money, you will never um, engage or you will never interact with that money with the same vigilance that you would with your own or money that you had earned by yourself. One way to deal with this problem is that owners can attempt to reduce the principal agent problem uh, with performance related pay. So if there is a job well done and so forth, then salary increases or increased benefits can be allocated uh, following the performance. And it is usually reasonable to assume that these firms will seek to maximize profits. And so as we move forward uh, with the semester, this is a fundamental assumption that we'll be making is that firms are profit maximizers. Now we've discussed other people's money, let's think about other people's labor. So we have contracts for products. So this is when we have a permanent transfer of ownership from a seller to a buyer. Uh, in this case, these contracts are generally short lived. Uh, sometimes you can purchase warranties on things and stuff like that, but um, nothing to the extent of a labor contract. Um, when we think about a labor contract, these temporarily transfer authority over a worker's activities to the manager or the owner. And so in this case, oftentimes, um, some, or sometimes these can extend over decades. And this can lead workers to develop firms or very firm specific assets, such as skills, networks, and friendships. And this leads to the same sort of thing in every type of field. Uh, so regardless of if you're a computer science or anything like that, uh, you'll have different firms who specialize in different softwares and you'll develop those skills and those will be sort of things that you'll hone over a long period of time. Continuing on other people's labor, uh, these contracts are typically incomplete. And so the primary reason is that it's impossible for firms to know exactly what they'll need a worker to do. So thinking back to your own experience, how many times did situations arise in which you worked for a firm that were not explicitly laid out in the job description? Uh, another reason is that it, it's just simply too costly for firms to observe exactly how well each employee does their job. There's also the issue with um, observability. It's very difficult to observe and accurately assess an individual's effort with a specific task. And even if the firm could, co or could observe a worker's effort and effectiveness, this information could not be the basis of an enforceable contract. So, um, in some cases, we see things like complete labor contracts, such as piece rate uh, contracts, but they're rare and they're, um, it's often very difficult because it's tough to put a dollar, a dollar value on many forms of output. So in this case, um, on the right, you can see the example of piece rates. Uh, sometimes they're common in agriculture. And usually what's happening here is you're being paid uh, basically based on a weight. Uh, so if you're picking or something, um, then whatever that weight happens to be at the end, you'll be paid and they'll sort of assess that over the hourly uh, or however many hours you worked. Uh, and it's difficult to measure the output of individual workers. Um, when contracts are incomplete, paying the lowest possible wage almost never minimizes a firm's labor costs. Uh, and so this is something that we'll dive deeper into when we cover the labor discipline model. So now thinking about why labor contracts uh, are incomplete, we discussed a lot of the things uh, in the last slide, but this sort of exercise helps you illustrate a couple examples. So think about things like a teacher, a retail worker, uh, a nurse, or an officer. There are just too many situations that could potentially arise within um, completing the job that you can't cover that entirely uh, within an enforceable contract. And so in this case, those contracts are generally just you are just left incomplete, uh, utilizing more vague language within the contracts. And now we'll discuss Marx, uh, a pioneer in sort of that transitional period between the classical and neoclassical economists. Uh, he witnessed the emergence of capitalism in England and is um, capitalism's most famous critic. 
Uh, his theory of historical materialism provides an explanation basically of all economic systems um, moving from slavery to capitalism. He famously wrote the Communist Manifesto, which celebrated um, the productivity of capitalism, but also criticized capitalism for undermining freedom and equality. And he argued that capitalists paid wages to rent workers' time and command them inside the firm. And so think about the process that's happening or that Marx is visualizing is that workers have this individual thing, this entity that we call labor power, and they enter into the marketplace and attempt to sell that labor power uh, to different firms or in capitalists in Marx's case. And he claimed that the reserve army of the unemployed gave capitalists power over the workers. Uh, and so when there are high rates of unemployment, um, individual workers or unemployed workers tend to compete with one another uh, as opposed to sort of recognizing different flaws within a uh, capitalist system. And so this gives the capitalists sort of um, leverage over these workers. And he advocated uh, for a communist society organized around the principle from each according to his ability to each according to his need. Um, and so in this case, we can discuss some of the things that Marx sort of envisioned or helped laid the foundation for as we move um, across uh, sort of his work's time period. So thinking about it in the historical context, uh, we have this graph here. Uh, sort of illustrating things are escaping the Malthusian trap. A number of reasons are obviously outside of permanent technological progress. We had a lot of things that were sort of implemented in this time period. So you can see the 10 Hours Act, the Factory Act. Uh, so these things sort of implemented institutions like ch child labor laws and so forth. Uh, they instituted like a mandatory uh, constraint in terms of the ma maximum hours individuals would work in, in a certain day and so forth. And it had a lot of implications um, moving towards a more contemporary time period. And so we can see the graph on the right illustrating that uh, over this same time period that we're visualizing here on the left, we have all these policies instituted. And what we see as a result is that individuals have higher life expectancies. Uh, and so you can also look at some of the scientific um, sort of discoveries uh, in the right graph in terms of things that also played a role in increasing the life expectancy. And so now we can ask the question, is Marx back? And so this graph illustrates the exponential increase in productivity. So um, from over this time period illustrated in the graph, we have a 238.7% increase in productivity. However, we've only seen a 109% uh, percent increase in hourly compensation. And so it begs the question as to why uh, these two aren't moving in tandem, um, whether exploitation plays a role in this and so forth. And thinking about other factors in terms of causes of mortality, uh, you can see the red line here illustrating US um, white non-Hispanics in this case uh, have the most frequent deaths per 100,000 relative to these other countries. Um, and we can see the sort of causes of these deaths and so forth. Different things like poisonings, lung cancer, suicides. Um, this is for the U.S. on the right. Uh, but it's, it begs the question as to what is sort of um, playing the major factor in these causes. Is working longer? Um, is not receiving proper hourly compensation playing a big role in these type of things? This is something that is basically an area for new research. And so if you are interested in Marxian economics, uh, we do offer this upper level course in Marxian economic thought with Professor Rama. Um, she's amazing. So if you're interested, make sure to take a look um, and see if you would like to take this course.